Hello gardeners, it's Mid-American Gardener time and so we are going to talk about anything that is topical to right now and we've got some great panelists so stay tuned. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois so I'll do cut flower and maybe perennial landscaping questions but we do have three more people here so listen to their expertise and then during the phone call time you can call in and direct it in that way. Well we're going to start first with John Bodensteiner. Hi there, John. Hi, I'm John Bodensteiner. I'm from Vermaine County, Danville. And uh, I guess my expertise or the things I like to, is tomatoes, vegetables, and then I also like hostas and uh, shrubs, bushes, just about uh, anything that grows in my yard, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty happy with. Well, surprise, um, you have a tomato with you. Uh, yes, I did bring <laughs> a show and tell. We have a lot of people that have garden sales in their yards and we don't have the best lighting sometimes, and we tend to get a tomato that looks like this. It's very, very tall. Usually this is very, very tender, and they tend to snap off. And I wanted to sh bring a, a sample in and just show what to do and how to plant it. What the first thing you would do is, is protect it, and then you would trim all these side shoots off. Uh, and even up to here, and possibly even this one. Now, what you need to do then is dig a hole that's deep enough to bury the tomato right up to here. And if you wanted to, you could even take it right up to here, take this one off too. Now, if you don't want to dig it that deep, what you can do is to lay it down and kind of very gently like this and, and, and point it up like this. And all these little hairs that if you look at, if you're familiar with tomatoes, you see a lot of little hairs on there all those turn to roots and with the dry seasons and the hot every little root that that tomato can get is going to help it survive absorb the calcium we had some calls last week mm -hmm. about calcium and just um, be much much healthier if it has more roots so lay it down dig it in but that's all that should be showing after you're done it goes from wimpy looking to sturdy. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's a sturdy plant yeah. when it's only showing yeah. that much. Yeah. Then Thank you. You only do that with tomatoes. You do not uh, do that with yeah. trees, trees or shrubs. No. <laughs> or that's, that's just causing the slow death. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, and well we've been spoken. having a lot of that with okay. trees. People yes. digging the holes and... Too many people plant their trees like tomatoes mm -hmm. and you yep. can't get away with it. So don't do that. But it's great for tomatoes. Thank yes. you, John. And now next is Kay Carnes. Hi, Kay. Hi. I'm a... Uh, Champaign County Master Gardener, um, and I, my areas of expertise are herbs, um, vegetables, uh, including heirloom vegetables, and um, some perennials. So I, I have a real love for variegated plants, and I also, of course, love herbs. So I'm always excited when I can combine the two, mm -hmm. and I brought tonight, um, <clears throat> this is a variegated marjoram plant that I have. Um, it's not as hearty and it's not quite as flavorful as a regular marjoram, but it's very pretty and it makes a really good ground cover or, or a border plant. And this other one is I'm really in love with. This is a variegated basil plant. It's called Pesto Perpetuo and <clears throat> it does not flower and so um, it'll never die off like regular basil plants. Um, it is uh, a patented plant, and so it's illegal to uh, propagate it, but it's a really lovely plant, and it'll keep this columnar-type shape um, as long as you have it. So I'm going to, this is the first year I've found one, and I'm going to put it in a pot and see just how long I can keep it, you know, maybe over winter if possible. They're both really pretty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's got a wonderful basil flavor and, and fragrance to it. Wow. Now for the marjoram, when um, it goes too far along in the season, sometimes it'll turn to green. Will you tell the folks what they do when you get a green section on a variegated plant? Cut it off. <laughs> Cut it off. <laughs> Don't wait. Yeah. Yeah. So you, especially, and I've this, got, you know, variegated sedums. You cut off the green yeah. part. Yeah. And this isn't variegated as much as it's just got a thin um, white margin mm -hmm. on the leaves. So it's not truly variegated, but it is right. two colors. So. Very fun. Well, thank you, Kay. That's nice. Okay, and then next to me is Dr. Phil Nixon. Hi, Phil. Howdy. 
I'm an extension entomologist with the University of Illinois, so I do bugs. And I want to talk a little bit about our, our best friend, which is the honeybee. <laughs> and you've been hearing some things, there have been some things in the, uh, in the news recently about, uh, about honeybees and uh, concerns about insecticides associated with them. Uh, the European Union, with a, on a close vote, decided to outlaw them for use on f fruit crops and vegetable crops. The news media is talking about it, everything. That is not the case. They're still legal to be used on trees and shrubs and turf, ornamental plants. And so, uh, but the point is, is that there's just also recently, which is not getting near as much press, a release by United States Environmental Protection Agency, US EPA, and what they are coming out with is saying a more balanced approach and is, is important. It's not that simple. The concerns we have are with imatocloprid, uh, which, we, which we use in controlling emerald ash borer, and uh, clofianidin and thiamethoxin used a lot associated with seed treatments on corn particularly. And they've shown, been shown to have some impact associate, and maybe related to some of the problems of colony collapse disorder, but there are also mite problems. There are migratory beekeepers moving them all across the country, increasing stresses those directions, uh, disease problems, a variety of things and stresses that are evolving. Insecticides, particularly the neonicotinoids, are appearing to be more of a problem than we thought initially but it is by no means as simple as we get rid of those, we get rid of a problem that will not do the case. And so you need to keep an open mind, keep a, uh, and realize that it's not as simple as just one thing. We would have had this under, figured out years ago if it was that simple. So keep, keep working on it. We continue to want to continue to hear. <laughs> for hundreds of years to come. You've got to show that insect book. It's a kid's insect book. It is great. You go wherever you can to find your props. <laughs> <laughs> but it has all kinds of insects, so I, I want to get one, actually. Insects, a soundboard book. That's really cute. Well, thank you. It, oh, no, I don't really want the mosquito one. <clears throat> but it is such a complex uh, situation, so thank you for uh, chatting about that because it is not just a one thing and fixing it. Now, next we have our video mail. So let's go to that and see a question about tomatoes. Hi, thank you for letting me send in this video email. I think it's a superb idea. My question is about this piece of land with the white rocks. I put my tomatoes here every summer and they do very well. They are, they grow to about six feet tall. They produce a great amount of tomatoes. So I don't know if the white rocks are beneficial for holding heat, reflecting light. I don't know what the reason is, but if there is a good answer, I will do this in the future with all of my tomato plants. Thank you very much. Okay, so there might be a few different people jumping in. John, you want to start? Sure. It, you know, it looks like she's getting full sun, which is very important with tomatoes. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to have sun there. It's against the building, so you're going to have the heat from the building reflecting. The white rock during the heat of the day is going to be absorbing some of the heat, but it's also going to be reflecting some of it away. So during the hottest part of the day, it may be helping um, help the tomato survive. Also help during the real hot days, it may keep them a little bit cooler so that the um, blossoms set. Uh, also during the night, once the sun goes down, some of the heat from the rocks is released, mm -hmm. and so you don't get that variation in, in temperatures, and so it could be, and also then the moisture is also going to be good, because any mulch is going to help with... Yeah, um, that's what we were talking with, about, um, how... With uh, keeping mulch. the calcium and, and the, all the chemicals going. Okay, any other? Did Well, it appears that that is uh, white limestone, which is going to be very high in calcium, and we get blossom end rot, uh, rotting mm -hmm. away in a black area on the bottom of the tomato fruit. And uh, the increased calcium may help reduce that problem. Mm -hmm. So that may help uh, have more tomatoes that are edible off of those plants as well. And that's also <coughs> a great mulch to keep weeds down. So that's, that's gonna help. 
and there's no competition with any other planter. No. So uh -uh. No the black hard wall. part is just getting the mulch away to dig it. But once you have it, it looks like that's a great spot. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for your video, and we'll hope that you, um, other ones, uh, others of you send in, because we'd like to see yours or uh, hear about your gardening challenges. So you can uh, send us your video at yourgarden at gmail.com. So um, we really enjoy seeing it. And especially if it's a plant ID, sometimes we just can't figure it out from your descriptions. Mm -hmm. It helps to mm -hmm. see it. All right, let's go to the phone lines, and we're going to start with line two, and it's a question about pruning cherry trees. Hi, line two. Hi. Uh, yeah, I have two cherry trees, and I'm not sure which one's which because I have yet to get a crop off of them, but when I pruned them this spring, they're supposed to be dwarf trees, so I pruned them back pretty severely, uh, but they did flower out very nicely, uh, both trees. And one is setting cherries, but the other one is setting leaves from where the cherry blossoms uh, were. Rather than setting fruit, I see a fresh tuft of three or four leaves growing out of each of those. And I'm just wondering if that's because I got a little too aggressive with pruning shears on the trees. Okay. Who's our cherry tree person? <laughs> did, did the uh, trees... Uh bloom at the same time or did one tree bloom at a different day? Because if they bloomed at different days, you could have had colder, windier, or rainy weather on the one that's not producing cherries and that would have kept the, the bees, the flies, the beetles, all the pollinators away and that could explain why you may not be seeing fruit on that tree if they did not bloom it on the same day. Or also are they the same variety or are they different varieties? Uh, one's a sweet cherry, one's a sour. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Which one has got the fruit I on it? Don't know which is which. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah, I just don't know because I've never had a harvest yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and it could have been that, you know, the variety you may have cut one variety back too far where you cut the fruiting. Now, if it bloomed, did they both bloom? They both bloomed okay. beautifully. I had <clears> hundreds of <throat> Then, then, then mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't be because you cut back too far because no. if they bloomed, you had the potential of having the fruit there. So that's not a problem. I if it's environmental. Mm -hmm. It or, could be, know, but we also have problems with sweet cherries uh, producing well, partly because they bloom too early mm -hmm. and get their blo and their fl blossoms get frozen off or, or killed. Um, my guess is with one being a sour and one being a sweet cherry, they probably did not bloom on the same day. So they we you could have had some dieback from from a frost at the wrong mm -hmm. time on the sweet cherry. I'm guessing it's going to be the, the, the uh, a pie cherry that's going to end up with a sour cherry. It's going to end up with the fruit on it mm -hmm. because they're more much more apt to bear. Uh, but still, they would not have been blooming at the same time in all likelihood. I grow both in my yard. They don't bloom on the same days. And so difference in weather can make a big difference yeah. in pollination. Okay, well, thank you very much for your question. Hopefully. Everything evens out one year. They both uh, mm -hmm. fruit for you. Bottom line, it's almost impossible to over prune a cherry tree. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Since <laughs> they both flowered. <laughs> okay, so that part's good. Now let's go to line three, and it's about wild mustard. Hello, line three. Hi. Um, my question is this wild mustard that's filling the fields and everything, is, is that the kind? that we can eat the mustard greens? And also, um, is it the type that is used to produce um, mustard uh, that we buy in the grocery store? No. Well, and there's that's several not kinds of wild mustard. Yeah. Right. And, and the one that you're seeing in the fields is really not a mustard, I don't believe. It's another, that, that I just, on the way over here, it didn't look like a mustard to me. What color is it that you're it's seeing? Yeah, they're probably yellow, but. What color? Bright yellow. Yeah, bright yellow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But mustard um, is yellow. I mean, mm -hmm. the yeah. flowers are yellow. But I, well, I don't know if, it, mustard really isn't blooming yet, I don't think. I, I have some of the wild mustard is blooming, is some of mine blooming. is. But I think the stuff in the fields that you if see. If it's true mustard, you can eat it. Yeah, yeah, yeah you I still can eat it, but it's going to be a lot, it's going to be bitter compared to what you buy. Well, but it's wild, that's, you yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, I, that's, you're right, it's not domesticated. You know, it's so. not, 
um, domesticated but, greens are usually grown for sweetness, mm -hmm. uh, whereas the, your wild greens, which are really more healthy for you, are tend to be bitter. Yeah, but um, you really but, need to get an edible identification yeah, on it. Yeah, don't, I would not eat it unless guess. you had it identified. Mm -hmm. So probably at your closest cooperative extension office or Google mustard and look at the leaves, mm -hmm. but I would still probably chat with the person. This would be a good thing to show on a video. Yeah. <laughs> so, but anyway, don't guess. Uh, but there's yeah. lots of yellow things growing. I mean, some yeah. of it's um, yeah, there are um, uh, some uh, golden Alexander, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I, I mean, they're in that APACA family, mm -hmm. but I don't know that. Yeah. Don't guess. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that question. That's a good question. And now on to line five, and it's about a tree. Hi there. Hello. What's your question? Hello. Yes, go ahead. Uh, you asked me about the tree? Yes. Uh, we have a couple of buckeye trees, and just very recently, all of the leaves have developed little yellow spots on them. And uh, up, uh, we have two of these trees, and, and they both have the same system. Uh, each, well, I'm looking at a leaf now that has thin little spots on it. And they're very tiny, about eight inch, I guess, bright yellow. Looks like they have a tiny black spot in the center of them. And then on the bottom side of the leaf, there's sort of a buildup of some kind of a crust. And uh, we've had this tree for about 20 years, and this is the first time it's ever had anything on it like this. So we wondered if there's any idea of what it might be. And is it, uh, it truly is a buckeye. It's not a, it's not a chestnut. Horse chestnut. Yeah. Pardon me? Is it a horse chestnut or a buckeye? How tall well, is it? Well, it's a buckeye as far as I know. Uh, it, it's not, uh, oh, I don't know. There's a difference between a buckeye and a horse chestnut. Honestly, I don't know. Yeah, they're in the same same genus, I believe. And well, we, uh, we do have another, another one that is from a different uh, origin. And it's slightly different in appearance, and it doesn't have any of this going on with it. What is the disease so, that horse chestnuts get? Because I know the ones that we had on campus, a lot of them just died out. Yeah, it's it's something that starts at the top. It's a, it's a it's a dieback or a blight on on the leaves, and and usually half or more of the leaf is turning brown. But the uh, but horse chestnuts and buckeyes uh, all have leaf diseases. Buckeyes tend to have fewer of them. Uh, and but with the with the wet spring that we've had and the cool mm -hmm. temperatures, that's been very conducive to leaf diseases. And I doubt that you have a uh, have something which is going to be uh, repeated because we're probably not going to have as wet a spring for several years in the future. Uh, one thing that will reduce these kind of, of foliage diseases if you have more air movement through the bush through the tree or bush. If it's a bottle bush buckeye, it's more of a bush. Uh, and so if you prune it out so that you get some air movement through it, it's not quite so heavy with foliage, it may not be as pretty of a plant to your eye, but on the other hand, it probably won't get as many leaf diseases either. It will dry, the foliage will dry out quicker and the fungi won't be able to do as well. But from what I know about uh, buckeye leaf diseases, it's nothing that's really all that much of a problem that uh, you need to worry about it. Okay, and it was a cold, wet, yeah. elongated mm -hmm. yeah. uh, spring. Yeah. And certainly they could go to their extension office or send mm -hmm. somebody to the plant clinic if they want more information on that. Okay, well, very good. Now, let's learn something about bamboo next. All right, well, we learned all kinds of fun stuff. Now let's go to line four and we're gonna hear a wheat question. Line four. Hello. Good evening. Beautiful day out there. Yes. Uh, I ha have an area that has always been kind of like a little ornamental area. Mm -hmm. And uh, since I don't have a gardener and I am incapacitated, it has got kind of wild and these Things that are coming up look like wild onions, smell like garlic. They're thin like green onions and mm -hmm. they grow in clumps. And the clump is like a good handful. And if you pull up, the, you have to dig the clump to get it up. 
and there's probably 25 or 30 of these little little stem green onion things in a clump, but they don't have the the garlic ball on top, and they don't have the onion flour on top. Uh, they just grow there. And I wondered, if we cut them off at the ground, can we spray them with Roundup to kill them? Sounds almost like ramps. Yeah, it sounds you'd like want to eat them. <laughs> it sounds like the wild, the wild, onions, oh, wild ra- onions. The ramps have a wider yeah, leaf. They have yeah, a wide leaf, do. not a narrow one. Uh, but uh, but it, there is a wild onion. Yeah, yeah. and it, it and it may not have flowered yet, so she may not see that bulb yeah. on the top yet. And I've got those coming up. But they come up very clustery. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they and can. After if you let them grow and grow and grow, they will cluster because all the little bulblets will. You know, they they put little bulblets down off of the main bulb. And pretty soon you've got mm-hmm. 20, 30, 40 of them, and they will come up. You have to dig them up. Now, if you want to use Roundup, you can't cut, them, cut all that green off and then spray what's left because you need the round, uh, that green part to absorb the, mm-hmm. the, um, the Roundup to take it down to those bulbs. And it's, it's tricky. I've tried it, and uh, you're... Uh, probably going to fight a losing battle because all the little bulblets are not going to absorb that chemical from the main chute because it's separated. It's got a... But she can certainly try. She can try. Mm. The best thing to, to, for me uh, uh, that I found is just to dig up, take a, a spade and get that get that out. Mm-hmm. And it takes, it may take a couple of years to get rid of them all. Okay, well, some exercise. Yeah, <laughs> or unfortunately. <you> <laughs> intermediate put a nice rock right in that okay well let's move along to line six and this is about an ash hello there hello uh thank you for taking my call i have a couple of, i have three large ash trees in the yard and uh, i was concerned about uh, any news about the emerald ash borer i know i live in chatham and i know it's not too far away i was wondering has there been any progress in the uh, annihilation of the emerald ash borer, or, you know, well, first how are you o- doing? <laughs> first off, that the emerald ash borer is not going to be annihilated. Mm-hmm. The ash trees might be, but not mm-hmm. the ash borer. Uh, but the we do have effective materials for control. Uh, Amatocloprid, which I talked about, associated with the honeybees, uh, used on the ash tree within uh, into the soil within two feet of the trunk is effective and the ash tree does not uh, does not produce anything that the honeybees are interested in so but you want to make sure you don't have any any flowers at the base of that tree that the bees might be attracted to uh, this is the ideal time to apply that mm-hmm. uh, and uh, you can also have a uh, have an arborist or a landscaper come in and apply emamectin benzoate or triage uh, they can apply the amatocloprid. They can also apply a material, dinotetheron, sold as safari. This is a ba- uh, b- bottom four and a half feet of a trunk is sprayed. All of these are effective for various amounts of time. And so we do have some good tools that will protect individual trees. Realize if you start treating the tree, if you want to continue to keep it until it's going to be able to survive indefinitely, you're probably looking at a treatment program of every year or every other or every third year for 20 years at least in order to by the time the uh, beetle comes up is done and you can go online at Illinois Department of Agriculture Emerald Ash Borer and find out where the beetle is located in the state how close it is to you we don't recommend treatment if it's more than 15 miles from a known infestation okay so annihilating the diseases or the bug is not really going to happen not, a, it's not just, an option it's yeah. gone too yeah, it's far gone. wow that's our, too bad. Yeah, all the firewood that was moved and yeah, yeah. Just, it's here. Okay, but at least be aware of all of this. Well, let's take a short quiz. I hope you're ready. We do try to educate and entertain. Well, it's been an interesting uh, year already for the gardener, hasn't it? It <laughs> yeah, seems sure. like we've had mm-hmm. some of everything. 
weather, environmental things. So what would you say is a good, th we don't have much time, but what's a good thing to be doing spring, early summer? Planting. <laughs> what? Planting. Planting. <laughs> Make sure you put some sort of collar around your new tomato plants that you put out. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to use tin cans with both ends cut out, uh, uh, a piece of cardboard around it, uh, a nail right down next to the stem. Oh, yeah, All of these that. help keep cutworms cut from worms, eating yeah. off your tomatoes. That's an important thing this yeah. time of year. And of course, weeding. It seems like we always need that. <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for watching. It's been a great show and we've learned a lot. We hope that you have a great week gardening, doing all of these things and more, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.